Hello, this is Mark from My Keys to Music. Thanks for joining me on this video. This will compare the differences between the Nord Stage 2 and the Nord Stage 3. If you already own a Nord Stage 2 and you're wanting to upgrade or potentially look at upgrading, this video will help. If you're brand new to the world of Nord keyboards and you have your eye on a Stage 3, you think that might be the one you want, but then you realize, wow, this is very expensive, it's a big investment, I wonder if I can get away with getting a Nord Stage 2. The price is a lot less, yes it's used, but there's some considerations there. This video will help you with that too. What we'll do in this video is we'll look at the manufacturer's official comparison chart on their website, and I'll walk you through it step by step, line by line, and we'll go through some of the nitty gritty details so that as a consumer, you can get more information than what you can get from that chart just by reading it. We'll even do live demonstrations when it warrants it so we can compare these features. I'll also give you my personal opinion whether this feature is important to me and then therefore important to you or not as we move along through the comparison. Okay, now a little bit of background here. So I'm recording this video in late 2022. Can you believe that the Nord Stage 2 was created way back in 2011? So that is a while ago. And the Stage 3, in fact, was created in 2017. That's when it was first released. Now they're no longer manufacturing the Nord Stage 2. They are manufacturing, as of this video, the Nord Stage 3. You can still get a brand new Stage 3 if you want one that's untouched and unvarnished direct from the factory or direct from the retailer, you can do that. If you are looking to get a Stage 2, you are going to have to go the secondhand route. That's no problem. These keyboards last for years. And the other thing to consider is that, well, if you were buying a computer that was created and released in 2011, you'd be laughed out of the room because computers really do change year by year, month by month in some cases. And if you were buying software that was created in 2011, you'd again be laughed out of the room because software changes month to month, quarter by quarter, year by year. The changes in the speed of innovation on those two types of platforms is incredible. But when it comes to hardware synthesizers, these are handmade in Sweden. They're crafted and done in such a way that number one, they're meant to last for years. And number two, the innovation in technology doesn't change as often as it would with a piece of software or an actual laptop computer, let's say. Very different things. When you buy a keyboard that's, let's say, 10 years old, yes, you are getting a 10-year-old keyboard, and maybe it is war-torn for 10 years if it was used heavily in a performance setting. Yes, that's a consideration. But from a technology standpoint, you're not going to be slipping that far back. And the other funny thing about this whole thing is you look on the internet now, you look on YouTube, and there are thousands of people clamoring and falling over themselves to buy keyboards that were created in the 80s. These old synths, these vintage synths. And of course, they're temperamental and all of this. The point being is there's something special about buying a keyboard because of what it does, how it sounds, and what it is. We don't have to get so hung up on when it was created as you would get hung up about when a computer was created or when a piece of software was created. To very different things. Let's begin the comparison. So I'm going to go over to nordkeyboards.com. I'm going to locate the products link and then locate the Nord Stage 3. Once I get to the details of the Nord Stage 3, I have this option up here called comparison chart where the manufacturer here has done a good job comparing the Nord Stage 2 and the Nord Stage 3 side by side here with the Stage 3 on the left side and the Nord Stage 2 on the right. And they've done this comparison because they realize that a lot of people are considering moving from a stage two to a stage three. But even if you are an electro owner or a wave two owner or considering any of the other Nord keyboards, you'll learn a lot just by going through this about the different features that Nord keyboards generally provide, especially here for the stage three and the stage two categories. All right, let's take a look. First, we have the key bed. Well, the keybeds are very similar between the two. In fact, they come with an 88, a 76 key, and a 73 key option. They both have those same options. The only difference here potentially is the Stage 3 76 has the Hammer Action Portable keybed versus the Stage 2, which seems to have just the 76 key weighted keybed. Those are two different keybeds there. Now, the only thing I'll say about the 76 Hammer Action Portable because I actually own the Stage 3 76 Hammer Action Portable, is that there is a lot of resistance in that key bed. As you push down on the keys, you actually feel, dare I say, it feels like you're kind of moving through the mud a little bit. Now, some people love that, especially those that grew up with a traditional piano feel, and they want that resistance, and they want that 
thick, heavy, heavy feel. They love the key bed, but there are others that absolutely despise it um, because it's not quite as smooth and as silky as the 88 key key bed or some of these other modern key beds that you have on, let's say, the Nord Grand, which is using the Kawai key bed versus all these other key beds here are using Fatar key beds, F-A-T-A-R. That's the manufacturer that makes the key bed and they make key beds for not only the Nord keyboards, but many other manufacturers as well. So ask 10 people what their opinions are of these key beds, and you will get 10 different answers. So this is a personal opinion and one that I really can't explore too much on this particular video. You just either have to play them in a showroom somewhere somehow, or roll the dice and buy the one you think would work best. I do have another video where I compare the 76 Hammer Action Portable with the Waterfall. I do it in a strange sort of way, but it does give you the idea of just how resistant that 76 Hammer Action Portable is. And if I were sitting in a room and I had two to choose from, I would choose the semi-weighted Waterfall as my favorite key bed because it's the one I can play the fastest on and I like to play fast a lot of times. I think I would love the 88 key key bed though as well. I think I'd be just as happy with that, maybe even happier with that over the waterfall. But if I'm comparing a 76 with a waterfall, I'd take the waterfall in a heartbeat. Next, we have the key range. Those are the same on all three, A to C, E to G, E to E, the same configuration for whether it's a stage two or stage three, nothing to talk about there. You have four configurable outputs on both, nothing to talk about there. You have the monitor input, which is a nice feature where you can take a phone, let's say, or a PA system, a small PA system, or something to generate music and input it into your keyboard. And then if you have your headphones, you'll hear both the music that you've just connected as well as your performance. In addition, that whole mix actually goes and is sent out on the keyboard as well. Then we have the program change pedal input. This allows you to move up and down a program using your feet. Basically, you get a foot switch pedal and you'll be able to do that. I have other videos on the channel here indicating how that's done and some of the options you have. Then we come to the system settings. First, programs. Bottom line here is you get 400 program locations in each keyboard. They're the same in that regard. The way they're organized in the banks versus the pages are a little different, but you get the same amount of locations, so that's not really anything to worry about one way or the other. Then you have five locations for the live program settings, same there. You do get seamless transitions on the Nord Stage 3, which you don't get on the Stage 2. Seamless transitions for a lot of people is somewhat of a notable weighted decision maker, in some cases even a deal breaker. I'll demonstrate that now. One example of a seamless transition is I'll start with the Spires MW sound. I'm holding the sustain pedal while switching the programs to something completely different. And so long as I hold the sustain pedal, until I let go of the sustain pedal, the old sound will no longer appear. So that's one example of a seamless transition. In this case, I held the sustain pedal, but this works for reverb tails and delay tails as well as you're transitioning from one program to another. It avoids those abrupt disconnects when you switch programs. Okay, next we have song mode. There is a song mode option which has a separate area to organize your programs. It doesn't increase the amount of space you have, it just increases your capability to organize the programs you already have. So a song mode is essentially a separate area, it's a list, if you will, where you can go from program to program up and down the list and organize it in the way that you see fit, but it points back to the programs you have in one of the 400 locations. That's how song mode works. It's a handy feature if you're doing a lot of program changes and you wanna keep organized on the stage three itself. If you are already a person who uses an iPad or a computer to drive your set list, then this song mode will have very little value to you if you don't use it. MIDI over USB, both keyboards have that. Split keyboard, well here is a big distinction between the stage three and the two. On the stage two, you get two individual splits which equate to three zones. So if I split the keyboard in two places, I have a left zone, a middle zone, and a right zone because that is what two splits will give you. On the stage three, 
you have three splits giving you four zones. You have a left zone, a left middle zone, a right middle zone, and a right zone. Although most of the time you won't need that much split capability, there are times in certain songs and or certain situations where you actually benefit by having the multiple splits. When I talk to most students, they're happy with just the one split. Bass in the left, piano on the right, that kind of thing. Basic splitting. But to have up to three splits is a nice benefit and something that should be noted. Not necessarily a deal breaker, but something notable. Crossfade between between split points. Another nice to have feature, not a have to have in my opinion, but when you are splitting the keyboard and you go from one distinct sound to another, that split point can be very abrupt if you go back and forth between the two or you accidentally play in one split zone versus the other. This crossfade makes that smooth. Let me demonstrate that now. Here I have a split at this point in the keyboard. On the left side I have a sine wave. On the right, I have the piano, and the distinction between the two is very abrupt here at this split point. Right here. So if we add a crossfade to that, it'll sound like this. And the piano will fade in while the sine wave fades out. Beautiful crossfade. Okay, next we come to the piano section. We have two gigs of memory on the stage three and one gig on the stage two. Now, the amount of memory you have does not in any way limit the samples you can actually use. In other words, the entire piano sample library from NordKeyboards.com, the entire collection, is available for you on either keyboard. It's just that the stage three has more storage space. So that means you could put more bigger pianos and have the convenience of having that capability with less swapping around and less monkey business to get more larger pianos on there. With the one gig option, yes, you are going to have to swap more or compromise more or sacrifice more so that it can fit in the, sa in the space that you have. So it's more of a convenience thing, but it doesn't, again, it does not limit you in terms of the types of samples or you'll have access to the same piano samples on both models. Piano locations, same sort of idea. You have more options and locations for the stage three, giving you more flexibility, but doesn't curtail in any way your ability to play a particular sample. Piano version library, they both use the V5 piano library, further confirming that this is the way it works. You have access to all the pianos. Piano polyphony, now here is a big difference. 120 voice polyphony, stereo and mono on the stage three, 40 for stereo, 60 for mono on the stage two. That's a big difference there. And for those who are playing lush piano sounds with a lot of notes and heavy sustain, you will notice potentially dropouts on the stage two long before you notice them on the stage three. I can't honestly say I have a lot of situations where I run out of polyphony on the piano engine, more so on the synth engine, but not almost never on the piano engine. Uh, so I say the stage three is pretty complete in that respect, but I could imagine if I had half the amount of polyphony on the stage two where I might feel and hear dropouts. Now, if you aren't going for heavy piano orientation in your playing, and it's just more something to have on a song or two, then the polyphony in the piano engine may not be a big deal for you. Advanced string resonance, both keyboards have that. Piano filters, the filter option here on the stage three gives you three choices between soft, a mid, and a bright. It's just one button that you click that immediately changes the EQ profile of the piano, either you know brightening it or softening it. It's more of a convenience feature. This is not a deal breaker. This is not something you have to have. It's something you could easily live without. I'll admit it is handy at times to have, but like I said, I can live without it. And you can always go to the main EQ in the effects section and tweak your piano that way as well. Selectable piano release, both of them have that with a dynamic capability. Pedal noise, both of them have that with the Nord triple pedal. Dynamic pedal, both of them have that again with the Nord triple pedal. I won't go into the details of these, uh, especially since both keyboards have it, you don't have to dwell on whether you need the feature or not, since they both have it. 
Now the organ section, organ modeling generation. We do have a newer version in the stage three. We're basing this off the C2D organ. It's their latest organ engine and they've put that in the Electro 6 and the Nord stage three as well. You know, you ask 10 people what they think about the organ engine, one old versus new, and you'll get 10 different answers. Some people like the old style better. Other people like the new version better. The manufacturer is trying to improve they assume they've done that with the C2D organ, so I would say most people would say that the C2D organ sounds better than anything before it. So, but again, that mileage will vary based on your own personal opinion. I don't think this would be a huge deal breaker either, although for some people, the organ sounds and what they have is really important to them. But that, those are people that are or organ oriented. Next, we have the pipe organ. Well, there are no pipe organs on the stage two, but there's two on the stage three. I think this is especially important if you plan on using the pipe organ. I see this in the worship settings a lot where someone might want to just fire up a pipe organ. You won't have to rely on a sample to do that. You just have it right there in the organ engine. Very convenient. There's your pipe organ. Comes in very handy for those religious moments. Um, but again, if you're not in a situation where you need that, then you're not going to miss having a pipe organ on the keyboard. Organ polyphony is full on both. That just means there is no limitation in the polyphony. You could literally click or push every single note, white key, black key, on the keyboard, and they will all sound at the same time. Rotary speaker simulation. Both of them have the ability to imitate a Leslie speaker. The difference here is that on the stage three, you can have independence, where you can have the rotary on for this one panel and off for another, whereas on the, on the stage two, the rotary is either on for both panels or layers or slots, as they call them, at the same time. It's either all on or all off. Now, you can assign those to one engine over the other, but once you assign the Leslie speaker on the organ engine on one slot on the stage two, it's committed to the second slot as well. Now, the synth section. So for the synth section, I think the best thing to do is compare them side by side. They are very similar in many ways. There's just a few areas that are different, but those differences might be notable, especially if you are a true synth enthusiast and you want the maximum possibilities and capabilities from your synth engine, then the Stage 3 has the advantage. But let me just go through each of these quickly, just so you get an idea. First, we have the option to set the level. That's the same. We already mentioned the number of split points. We have three split points with the stage three offering four zones. Here we have two split points offering three zones. So that's depicted here. The ability to turn the engine on and off, the ability to move the octaves up and down. We have optional pitch stick and sustain pedal buttons here. Same here, pitch stick and sustain. We have an advantage here with the stage three in that we can actually determine the pitch stick range options. It's not just limited to positive two or negative two semitones. You have a variety of options for the pitch stick. There is a KB hold here for the stage three, which is represented, I believe, over here with the latch pedal on and the keyboard gate. LFO is very similar. We have a rate knob. Here we have one extra pattern, one, two, three, four, five patterns. Here it appears that we have, when no lights are illuminated, we have a gate pattern. Then we have sort of a reverse saw, then a triangle, and then a sample and hold pattern. So one extra pattern for the stage three from what I can see. The modulation envelope is similar, if not the same. Here we don't see that the decay on 10 equals sustain. Here the decay all the way to 10 does equal sustain. I don't have a stage two to confirm that and I didn't look it up in the manual, but it's likely that if you put the decay all the way to 10, it actually represents full sustain. Here we see that there's a velocity option against the mod envelope. We do have that here, even though you don't see the button here, it's depicted over here, modulation envelope velocity with a single setting for both. Then up here, we have the voice section where we can choose between mono, legato, and glide amount. Here, that's here, mono, legato, and glide amount. We have unison of no unison, one, two, or three. Here we have unison of no unison, one, two, or three, just like that. We have the ability to initialize the sound. That's done over here. Now, here below where we see the oscillator OLED display on the stage three, 
This is where we have a lot more functionality on the stage three, where we can mix and match different oscillator configurations, providing some interesting advanced synth options. For example, we can take a saw wave and mix it with a square wave, and we can determine the exact amount of that mix. That's just one example of one oscillator configuration. If you want to see a detailed expose on the oscillator configuration, you can check out my, my stage three synth training that I have online, or you can sign up for Master the Nord stage three at mykeystomusic.com, where we go through those details lesson by lesson in video format. All right, not only are there oscillator configurations on the stage three, the screen is easier to work with. Here we have just a digital number readout versus a visual readout, where a lot more information is provided on the stage three side. On the stage two, we can choose between these waveforms, these three waveforms, along with the ability to play samples, some FM synthesis capability, and some wavetable capability. Here we dedicate the classic oscillators in their own section, and the main four are represented sine, sawtooth, square, and triangle. We also have the wavetable option. We have an additional format option, which is not available here on the stage two. And most notably, we have the Super Wave option, which is an extremely handy and quick to set up option that you'll be using over and over and over again for various sounds. Let's take a look at the Super Wave option available only on the Stage 3. Here I have a blank sound. I'm going to turn on the synth engine. I'm going to adjust it to the Super Wave saw. I'll add one notch of unison, give it a touch of release, bring the frequency down just a touch, Add some reverb, which you don't see here on the camera, but I'm putting a stage reverb at about a four or five. And now you've got songs like this. Continuing on, here we have an oscillator control amount knob, which can manipulate these configurations. The closest thing to that on the stage two is this shape knob. But here again on the stage two, you're not going to have the same kind of oscillator configuration options that you do with the Stage 3. You get six filter options for the Stage 3. Here for the Stage 2 we have five. The one that's missing here from the Stage 2 is, I believe, the LPM, which is the Low Pass Moog filter. The rest of them are the same. Here on the Stage 2 we have keyboard tracking, which is limited to a single setting. Here we have three settings for KB tracking. Also note an additional drive option, which is absent from the Stage 2. We have the LFO amount, which is the same between the two. We have your standard resonance here, and your frequency cutoff, which is here. Then we have the option to use either velocity on the left side or modulation on the right side. That's similar between the two keyboards. Then we have the amp envelope, which provides attack, decay, and release. Same with the stage three. Stage three has this additional sustain label. So Option to 10 is sustain. I assume the same holds true for the stage two. We have up to three options for velocity against the amp envelope. Here we only have the single option for the amp envelope velocity settings. The vibrato options are the same between the two with one, two, and three delay options along with aftertouch and wheel for vibrato amounts. Another thing to note is that on the Stage 3, you can save all of these synth settings as their own storage location called a synth preset. Then you can bring up that synth preset and use it for various programs. No such synth preset exists on the Stage 2. So seeing how we just went through the synth section in great detail, we'll be skipping down here to the sample memory area. You do get more sample memory, 100 megabytes more in the Stage 3. This won't limit the fact that you can play samples. You can play any sample from the library that the keyboard is compatible with. You just can't do as many at the same time. So again, this is not really a feature limitation. It's more of a feature convenience. There's a little less convenience with the stage two. I would not put a lot of weight and stock into this particular difference. The arpeggiator, they both have arpeggiators with master clock synchronization. The synth polyphony, another sort of a deal breaker. At 34 voices, I sometimes even run out of polyphony there with the stage three. I do find that there are times where notes are dropped and, you know, you'd love more. You always want more polyphony, right? Well, 18 voices, you are going to notice that even more on the stage two. Again, if you are a heavy, heavy synth-oriented person, you probably just want to go for the stage three and, and go for it that way. The 18 voices, I think, would be kind of a limitation, especially if you're going to use like ambient sounds 
with a lot of sustain and you need a lot of voices at the same time, yeah, it won't be long before you run out. Then we get to the effects section, and these are more the same than they are different. In fact, the modulation effects here, of course, flanger, phaser, auto wah, pedal wah, tremolo, pan, ring modulation, and vibe are identical between the two. Uh, I can't tell you for sure if they use the same exact circuitry or the chips or the algorithms in the machine. So that is this the exact same vibe that they used one to the other. That would be beyond the scope of this video. But it, in all likelihood, they are the same algorithms and chipsets for both. The effect settings, you have the rate and the continuous depth on both. The delay, both have a decent delay. The stage three has a slightly better delay in the fact that you can do high pass, low pass, and band pass filtering on the tail of that delay. And I would say that that's a nice to have, not a have to have, not a deal breaker. Wouldn't put a lot of weight into this. I can count on one hand the times that I really depended on one of those filtering on the delay. The rate of FX synchronization, yes, with master clock. And that's just, you can synchronize your delay, for example, with the master clock. So the delays in time with the beat. EQ, they both have an EQ, uh, three band mid sweep. In fact, there's the LP24 and the HP24 filter on the EQ. I do use that occasionally on the stage three. It does come in handy from time to time. But again, I wouldn't put a lot of weight in that. Certainly not a deal breaker, something you could live without. Amp speaker simulation, they both have the JC, the twin, and the small simulation along with overdrive. So they're the same there. The compressor, they both have a basic compressor. I don't use the compressor much, but the compressor on the stage three can be individualized for each slot, also known as a panel. So synth A, for example, can have compressor on at certain level. Synth B can either have no compressor or compressor on at a different level. So those are independent that way. But again, compressor is not something I use too much. It's not a deal breaker item in my book. Reverb. The reverbs are almost the same in terms of the number of modes. You have six modes. I don't know if the circuitry is the same between the two. I have seen that the Nord keyboards tend to change the reverb the most out of all the effects, like from one keyboard to another. There seems like they're always either improving or tweaking the reverb offerings between the Electro, the Wave 2, and the Stage keyboards. The bright mode, which you get on the stage three, is an interesting situational effect that is very nice to have. I'll say that. I, I would put a little weight into that. That is a really nice thing to have. If you are playing a solo lush sound that has a lot of reverb, where you would take advantage of that bright setting and actually be able to hear it. If you're playing in a combo group, a three-piece group, a four-piece group, a five-piece group, whether you have the bright reverb or not, no one's going to notice. It's just going to be swallowed up in the mix along with everything else. It's only going to be noticed probably better for recordings than it would even be for live playing. So a deal breaker only if you're the type of musician where you're going to do a solo church gig and you want that ah effect of having that nice bright reverb wafting through the rafters because it does make a difference. But it's a subtlety that probably wouldn't change my mind if that was the only thing uh, that I had to choose on. Then finally, we get to dimensions. Gosh, these are nearly identical between the two models. The weight is slightly different between the two, and it's usually within about one pound difference one way or the other. The width, depth, and height, however, are exactly the same between the models. So dimensionally and weight-wise, there's nothing to even write home about here. It doesn't matter. It doesn't even, it shouldn't even pop up as a decision point at this point. Okay, so that's the comparison. And what I would do next, I've got some homework for you. If you want to get some firsthand opinions of some people that own both of these side by side and want to get a real hands on opinion, feel free to check out the link below in the description. I've put a link to the Nord user forum where you can read about this. There's two pages as of this video, two pages of people's comments going back and forth, trying to make this important decision between the two keyboards. So you can get some other opinions other than mine, and maybe even ask a question if you wanted to become a forum member and join right in, dig into the party, and see if you get any people to respond to that. If you have a particular question that isn't already addressed, feel free to ask a question here below this video. Make as many comments as you want. I'm used to answering comments about these keyboards. Feel free to subscribe if this is the kind of thing that has helped you make a decision. And now you've bought an Nord keyboard and it's time to get some training. This is the place to be.